Welcome to lecture 36. This is on creation and annihilation operators. What I want you to think about is in single quantization, we have a complete set of states that are indicated by the set psi n of r, if I think in terms of position state, or just the set of kets labeled by some integer n, if I think more abstractly in terms of energy eigenstates. And what we want to think about here is how do we form many body states, n particle fermionic states, where n has nothing to do with the n listed in those sets above. How do we form them in such a way from those single particle states that they maintain the important condition that fermionic states must have that they're totally anti-symmetric? So the answer to this question was worked out by John Slater, perhaps as early as the 1920s, certainly by the 1930s, if it wasn't in the 20s. And what he did was he said, look, let's denote the coordinates of the different particles by the label R sub I. And that label is just a generic label that includes both the space and spin coordinates. Then the many body wave function, which is a function in coordinate space, of R1, R2, R3, all the way out to Rn, it's a huge multivariable function. We can write that as 1 over the square root of n factorial, that's the normalization, multiplied by the sum over all permutations p of minus 1 to the p times the products of psi n1, psi n2, psi all the way out to n big N, with the arguments being a permutation of the coordinates, the space and spin coordinates, given by the permutation of the first one, the second one, etc., associated with, with each of those arguments. Now, when I sum over all of those permutations, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have all possible products of those single particle states expressed in terms of the different possible coordinates that they, that they can have. And you can sort of think of that as the situation where the electron is represented in terms of those different states. So summing over all of those permutations is what I need to be able to look at every possible many body state. And the minus one raised to the power of the permutation, where that is equal to one if the permutation is an even permutation, and minus one if it's an odd permutation, is exactly what is needed to guarantee that that wave function will be anti-symmetric under the interchange of any one of those two particles, or if you like, any two coordinates of the multivariable function. If I interchange any of those two coordinates, the function needs to change sign. Now, those of you that know linear algebra might recognize that that sum is actually the determinant of a matrix that would be formed by making columns of the size indexed by the different arguments. So I'd have psi 1 of R1, psi 1 of R2, psi 1 of R3, etc., all the way down to psi 1 of Rn. And then I would have, that would form one column, and then I would have psi 2 of R1, psi 2 of R2, psi 2 of R3, etc. If I take the determinant of that matrix, that's exactly what this many body physics wave function would be. Now, of course, this representation is really quite painful. If you think about it, all I really need to know is what were the different single particle states, and then I can construct the many body physics wave function that is completely anti-symmetric from them using this procedure that is written at the top of the page. And because it's notationally difficult to deal with these Slater determinants, there's a new formalism that was developed called the occupation number representation. Now, you've already had some experience with the occupation number representation when we talked about photons in the last two lectures. But here we're going to be looking at the occupation number representation for fermions. And there's a lot of differences between the photons and the fermions. And the way that the occupation number representation works is just like what we did with the photons. We're going to denote each of the wave functions that are going to be included in the Slater determinant exactly in the way that I just described. So let's take a look at some examples of that. The state 1, 0, 0, 0, etc. would just be psi 1 of R1. That would be a single particle state where the electron is in state psi 1. The state 0, 1, 1, 0, etc. would be 1 over square root of 2, psi 2 of R1, psi 3 of R2, minus psi 3 of R1, psi 2 
of R2. Notice that the indices of the size are representing the two different states that I'm occupying, which are psi2 and psi3. And the indices of the arguments are representing the two different electron particles, which in this case correspond to 1 and 2. And the minus sign comes about because of the change in sign due to the permutation. The 1 over square root of 2 is, of course, just the normalization. Okay, so it's still going to be quite difficult to work with those states if every time I want to do something with them, I have to convert them into this determinant. If I was working with more than just, I don't know, maybe three or four of these states, it would be even hard to write down what one of these determinants was. And it can get to be very challenging to actually do any kind of a calculation. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce some abstract operators in this occupation number space representation in the spirit of Dirac. And so we're going to take a C dagger K operator that's going to create the state K. And so it's going to only work if NK is equal to zero. And then it's going to replace the state with a state where the NK is being increased to one. And the CK does the same, does the opposite thing. It only acts on a state where NK is equal to one. And it's going to reduce the NK from one to zero and destroy an electron in that state. Now, the Pauli exclusion principle tells us that NK can only be equal to 0 or 1. So we must have CK dagger squared and CK squared both equal to 0. And here is where things are very different from the photon creation and destruction operators. The photon creation operators, A dagger, I could raise that to any power because I could have an arbitrary number of photons in any given mode of the light or of the electric field that I'm representing. But that's not the case for electrons. For electrons, I can have 0 or 1, and that's it. In many respects, you may think that this makes the problem a lot simpler, and in many respects it does. However, we have to worry about something related to the change in sign that we're going to be encountering in just a moment that co comes from the fact that the wave function for the fermions must be totally antisymmetric. Okay, so let's see how we're going to work this out. We're going to define the vacuum state as the state 0. You're familiar already with the vacuum state from photons. CK dagger acting on the state, that's the same. It, I shouldn't necessarily say that's exactly equal to, but that would be equal to if I put a R1 bra on the left-hand side, that would equal psi K of R1. CK dagger 1 uh, prime, CK dagger acting on the state 0. The ordering is important here. I have to think of that as the k acting first and then the k prime. And so it's written as 1 over the square root of 2 psi k of r1 psi k prime of r2 minus psi k prime of r1 psi k of r2. And on the other hand, if I looked at ck dagger, ck prime dagger, notice the order of those two operators is different. In that case, I get 1 over square root of 2 psi k prime of r1 psi k of r2 minus psi k of r1 psi k prime of r2. If you look carefully at those two lines, you can immediately see that those two wave functions are differing by a sign. And what that means is that ck dagger prime ck dagger plus ck dagger ck dagger prime, that must equal 0. So the anti-commutator of suit two CK daggers must vanish. And I can take the Hermitian conjugate of that. That tells me the anti-commutation rela relation of two CKs is going to equal zero as well. We already know that CK dagger squared and CK squared are equal to zero. That's consistent with this anti-commutation relation. And the one that we haven't worked out yet is the one on the far right, which says CK dagger CK prime anti-commutator is delta KK prime. Let's take a look at how that works. Imagine I have a vacuum in the K state. I apply a CK dagger on it. It gives me the state with one fermion in that state. I apply a CK dagger on that again. I'm going to get zero. If I have a CK on the vacuum, that gives me zero. If I have a CK on the one state, that gives me the vacuum. And so what that tells me is CK dagger CK acting on the vacuum, that's equal to zero. CK dagger CK acting on the one state, that's equal to the one state. And you can see CK dagger CK is going to count the occupation number of the state K. We're going to define NK to be CK dagger CK. And then NK, the commutator of NK with CK dagger, using those commutation relations that we talked about before, 
can simply be written as CK dagger CK CK dagger because the term that I get when I subtract has a CK dagger squared. And that just equals CK dagger times the anti-commutator of CK with CK dagger, which I get by doing the add zero trick. And that's, of course, equal to CK dagger. So we get the commutator of NK with CK dagger is equal to CK dagger. Similarly, if we work out the same thing with the CK operator, we find that the commutator of NK with CK is equal to minus CK. So this is very similar, again, to the raising and lowering operators for the simple harmonic oscillator. If you don't see that similarity, I encourage you to pause the video and go take a look at that. Just like what we did in photons when we summed over all modes, the total number operator is the sum over k of this nk. That's the total number operator. It simply counts the total number of fermions that are in these different occupied states. How do we represent operators? One electron operators turn out to be actually fairly simple to represent in this situation. So let's look at a matrix element of a single particle operator between two single fermion states. So I have one state that's going to be denoted by L and sigma, and I have another state that's going to be denoted by L prime and sigma prime. This would correspond to an R, R prime. And I have the matrix element of this operator between those two states. If I go to the coordinate state basis, I can write that as an integral over R1, dR1, psi L of R1, chi sigma dagger. That should be a star on the psi L of R1, or you can simply assume that that psi is real. O hat of R1, sigma sigma prime. That is a general operator that is a function of R1, but is also a function of the spin coordinate, so it has a matrix structure to it. I get a chi sigma prime and a psi L prime of R1, and we'd have to do that integral. So there's a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between this operator and the sum of this matrix element multiplied by a C dagger L sigma and a C L prime sigma, where L is labeling the spatial wave function and sigma is labeling the spin wave function. Now I know that this notation is often a little bit hard to directly follow because we're doing things like going from coordinate space and matrix elements into this second quantization formalism. So I want to carefully go through an example that shows you exactly what this means and how it works. So let's take a look at the momentum operator. The momentum operator is minus i h bar gradient. If my states are plane waves given by 1 over the square root of v e to the i k dot r chi sigma, and I'm going to just call that phi of k sigma, then the matrix element of the momentum, when that gradient acts, it's going to pull down an i k. So the momentum operator is going to just give me an h bar k. I'll have this integral of 1 over the volume, the integral over the volume of e to the minus i k dot r chi sigma dagger multiplied by this minus i h bar gradient chi sigma prime of e to the i k prime dot r. The gradient, as I mentioned, is going to just become h bar k. Because there's no spin dependence to this operator, the operator spin dependence is just a delta sigma sigma prime. And we're going to get a delta of k minus k prime as well because if k does not equal k prime, that integral is equal to zero. And if k equals k prime, that integral is going to give me v, and that cancels the one over v. And so what this is telling us is that if I work in the eigenstate basis of the operator, then when I calculate the matrix element, the matrix element is a diagonal operator given by the eigenvalue corresponding to the diagonal elements or the states that correspond to those diagonal elements. So that tells me that this momentum operator in first quantization is equivalent to the following summation over kk prime sigma sigma prime delta sigma sigma prime delta kk prime. That's because the matrix element is diagonal. h bar k, that's the value of the matrix element, multiplied by c dagger k sigma ck prime sigma. And I can just write that as the sum over k and sigma, h bar k, c dagger k sigma, ck sigma. Or we can write that as the sum over k sigma, h bar k, and k sigma. Now I want you to pause for just a moment to think carefully about what this means. What this means is when I have an occupation of the state k, I'm going to get a contribution of h bar k to the total momentum. And it's 
the sum over k and sigma just says, and now go ahead and just accumulate that over all the possible states that you have. And if you think about that, that is what a momentum operator should mean. And it's rather comforting that when we go to the second quantized formulation, the representation of the momentum operator in a second quantized form has a physical meaning that makes sense. And if you're having any trouble with following why that physical meaning makes sense, I do encourage you to send me an email so that we can talk about that further. Okay, let's look at a spin operator. We use the Pauli matrices, SZ is 1 half, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. I'm using this Gottfried notation here with no H bar. Uh, so the sum over L of 1 half C dagger L up, C L up, minus C dagger L down, C L down, or 1 half the sum over L, N L up, minus N L down. The S plus and S minus correspond to sum over L, C dagger L up, C L down, and the sum over L, C dagger L down, C L up. You can see that really makes sense. Let's look at the S plus. It says, if you have something in the state that is down, replace it, not changing the spatial state, but changing the spin state to up. And that's exactly what S plus does. Similarly, the S minus does the opposite. It takes a state that is in the up state and switches it to the down state. All right, we're now going to talk about two particle operators. These turn out to be much more complicated. The most important two particle operator for us is the Coulomb interaction between two electrons, which is E squared over Rij or E squared over the modulus of vector Ri minus vector Rj. We have to look at the matrix element of this. We take the matrix element between two electron states because there are two electrons that are involved in this operator, the electron sitting at site I and the electron sitting at site J. So it's a two electron state on the left as the bra, and it's a two electron state on the right as the ket and i can see there is a typo here those the bra should be l1 sigma 1 l2 sigma 2 the ket should be l3 sigma 3 l4 sigma 4 it looks like that 3 just didn't quite get copied correctly and the operator i put a 2 subscript on the operator just to denote the fact that it's a two particle operator and taking that matrix element we then Multiply it by C dagger L1, sigma 1, C dagger L2, sigma 2, C L3, sigma 3, C L4, sigma 4. And again, what you can think of that is it takes something in the state that corresponds to the 3, 4 coordinates, operates on it, and produces a state in the 1, 2 coordinates. That's kind of a way that you can think of this operator acting on the two particle states of the fermions. So in this notation, the outer symbols, 1 and 4, correspond to R1, and 2 and 3 correspond to R2. It is very important that you remember this relationship because it's easy to confuse yourself and think about doing it in the opposite fashion. Again, 1 and 4 correspond to R1, 2 and 3 correspond to R2. So now when we write down this matrix element, we have an integration over R1 and R2. We have a phi star L1 sigma 1 of R1 a phi star L2 sigma 2 of R2. We have the operator, which is a function of R1 and R2. We have the psi L3 sigma 3 of R2, not R1. And we have the phi L4 sigma 4 of R1. And that's, again, using this rule that we just stated. All right, let's try to do this calculation in the case where the two-particle operator is the Coulomb repulsion. Or in this case, we're going to just focus on a central potential that depends just on the distance between the two particles. So we're thinking about a two-particle isotropic interaction. We're going to evaluate this in the plane wave basis. So because the plane waves don't depend on spin, we're going to get delta functions on the spin between the 1, 4, and the 2, 3 electrons because those are the fermions that are being identified with one another. We put in the plane waves. We get a 1 over v squared. We get e to the minus i k1 dot r1 minus ik2 dot r2 plus ik3 dot r3 plus ik4 dot r4. We get the potential as a function of this distance between r1 and r2, and we get a integration over r1 and r2. So that is essentially copied on the next line. The only difference on the next line is that we've grouped together the terms that are functions of r1 and the exponential, and we've written down the delta functions corresponding to the spin. Now, the way that we're going to integrate this, we have to introduce 
coordinates that we've already introduced before. They're the center of mass and the relative coordinate. So R1 is given by center of mass plus the relative position divided by 2. And R2 is given by the center of mass minus the relative position divided by 2. We're assuming that these are indistinguishable particles, so the masses are the same. So we're not worrying about any masses in these definitions. We get 1 over v squared, delta sigma 1, delta sigma 4, delta sigma 2, delta sigma 3, the integral of e to the minus i, k1 plus k2 minus k3 minus k4 times big R, and then e to the minus i over 2, k1 minus k2 plus k3 minus k4 dot little r. v is just a function of little r, d big R, d little r. So the integration over big R can immediately be done. You see it's just a exponential. And we know when we integrate an exponential like that over a volume, we're thinking about the volume as having periodic boundary conditions. Again, this is an integral that we did in the photon unit. That integral is equal to 0 if k1 plus k2 minus k3 minus k4 is not equal to 0. And it, if that exponent is equal to 0, that integral is equal to v, and it cancels one of the factors of 1 over v. So we end up with 1 over v, the delta functions for the spin, e to the minus i, k1 minus k4 dot r. There we have used the fact that k2 minus k3 is equal to k4 minus k1, and we've used that to then simplify the exponential as just minus i k1 minus k4 dot little r. We have v of little r dr, and then we have this delta function of k1 plus k2 minus k3 minus k4. The delta function can be pulled out of the integral, and if you think about it, the 1 over v, um, it looks like I'm keeping the 1 over v out, that integral is the Fourier transform of this potential, and it's a function of k1 minus k4. So if we look at and I think the 1 over v should actually be included in that definition of the Fourier transform. As you see, I have it in there in the line below. So the 1 over v is needed in the definition of the Fourier transform. That's a typo in the notes. So if I take v of r equal to e squared over r, you can actually do this integral exactly. I hope you have seen that somewhere in your calculations in different classes. If not, you can again send me an email and tell me you've never seen that before. I do have some notes on that somewhere that I can dig up and show you. You also can find it in a number of different physics textbooks. They'll show you how to do that integral. So the this Fourier transform is a function of k1 minus k4 and it turns out to be 4 pi over times e squared divided by k1 minus k4 quantity squared times 1 over v. So now we take that matrix element, we plug it into the definition of the Coulomb operator in the second quantized formalism, and we get a one-half. You might be wondering where the one-half comes in. That comes from what is called double counting because of issues related to the fact that the electrons are indistinguishable. And even though we decided that one of them is noted as R1 and the other noted as R2, they could be the same as vice versa, and so we actually have to have this one-half factor that is put in to avoid a double counting, and counting the operator's strength is twice as big as it is. We multiply by that matrix element, 4 pi e squared divided by q squared times the volume. We have a sum over three momenta, which we call kk prime and q, and we have a sum over the two spins. And we have a C dagger K plus Q sigma, C dagger K prime minus Q sigma prime, C K prime sigma, C K sigma. And this is set up in such a way that those guys will satisfy the appropriate momentum conservation that we have for this problem. Now this way of dealing with the creation and annihilation operators goes over under the name second quantization. I've been using that name already throughout the lecture. You know, when you see something new like this, you really have to spend some time working with this operator formalism until you get comfortable with it. Now you have a little bit of experience with it in our working with the photons. We're essentially spending the rest of the class focusing on giving you practice and training and how to use this operator formalism in doing calculations of problems that involve more than one fermion. These kinds of problems can be very important in condensed matter physics 
because we're constantly working on lattice models that include fermions and this also includes in many cases spin models because most of the spin models are coming from the spin associated with the electrons if those electrons are localized which can happen in many cases then you don't need the full second quantization formalism of the electrons because it's only the spin degree of freedom that is playing any role but if you have what is called itinerant magnetism or you're interested in things like superconductivity or metal insulator transitions or other things like that then you have to work with the full degree of freedom of the electron and then we find working in the second quantized formalism is very helpful and allows you to make progress much more rapidly than you would if we had to work with these I will call it crazy uh, Slater determinant notation because it's really difficult to work with that when you're working with a large number of electrons. Okay, that's all that we have for lecture 36. In lecture 37, we're going to talk about some applications of how one works with these operators and get you some practice in manipulating them and using them so you can build up the experience that you need to become comfortable with working with these operators. And then we're going to look at some more applications and a very, very important model in condensed matter physics called the Hubbard model. We'll be talking about that for four of the remaining five lectures that we have.